come up, or I can just shout. God, there we go. Good evening, and welcome to uh, the Long Now Talks, April 2023. And I, you know, a special shout out to you, the audience, because this is our first time here in Club Fugazi. What do you think? And, uh, and also, uh, show of hands, Long Now members, wave your hands. And everybody else uh, watching remotely, wave your hands and say hello to your dog. Um, wonderful to have you here. I think this space works pretty well. Um, and oh, show of hands, who here has been to Beach Blanket Babylon? Okay, that's everybody who's a member of AARP. Um, <laughs> A couple of housekeeping details here is um, you, you notice they have a bar here. Um, after the talk, stay here and continue your conversation. The bar and the food and everything will be open. And then, of course, uh, for if there's anyone, I, I, this is where I feel a little bit like the, the, the flight attendant doing the seatbelt description and everybody goes, yeah, yeah, I heard it a million times. But in case there's somebody who's never flown in a long now talk before, you have these uh, question cards. And please, during the talk, if a question occurs to you, um, uh, just fill it in and someone will come past and pick it up. And, and if you attach a $20 bill to it, uh, Kevin Kelly, who uh, will be screening, will make sure yours gets done. I'm just kidding. Don't, don't, please don't put a 20 on. Okay, uh, enough of housekeeping. It is my pleasure to introduce Ryan Feeling. And and the job for me, I've you know, it's hard to introduce someone you don't know, but it's even harder to introduce someone you've known for a very long time. And my observation about Ryan is that she is a serial visionary and entrepreneur who has been working at the intersection of genomics and biotech and now conservation, but the whole time with her focus really clearly on consumers and the greater public good. Um, so now she's got this wonderful, uh, well, you, you will hear more about what she's up to. Um, she, the official part, she's co-founder and executive director of Revive and Restore, which if you look at her bio, it, it would say it's her third major uh, launch of something. She had previously launched DNA Direct and uh, Direct Medical Knowledge, which were all about empowering consumers around healthcare. In fact, it's not, this is not her third, it's like her sixth or her seventh uh, 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 run at doing really important stuff. Um, I should also say, in addition to the formal part, she has been a cornerstone of the Long Now Brain Trust since Long Now started. Uh, just absolutely essential to shaping the organization. But above all, what I've noticed, so my day job is I'm a long range forecaster. Um, and so I pay attention to people who are good at forecasting. And Ryan has this absolutely unerring ability to see emerging connections way ahead of the crowd, way ahead of the pack. And what I've watched is the first time she'll mention something new you know, everybody go, huh, that's, that's kind of surprising and interesting. Then after a while, everybody says, oh, 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 you know, about a year later, oh, now I start to get, get it. But then eventually that turns back to surprise because when you realize what you think you got really was only part of the story and Ryan was doing something much deeper and much more surprising. So all I can say is I invite Ryan up to the stage, prepared to be surprised. Ryan? Thank you. You know, before I begin, I first just want to welcome my friends that are here and Long Now members and lots of familiar faces from over all the years. I'm just curious, is anyone here, if you could show, your, uh, raise your hand, here to see Beat Blanket Babylon? Okay. <laughs> So, so that's good. Is anyone here to hear about conservation? Raise your hand. Okay. And how about a show of hands for those who are interested in biotech? Okay, well, that's a good sign. So we're all on the same page. So let me begin.
This is a painting by Isabella Kirkland, an incredible artist who's actually in the audience. <laughs> Its title is Back, and it depicts 48 species that were all brought back from the brink of extinction. This happened just at the end of, uh, of the, excuse me, of the late 1990s, and it was done using traditional tools of conservation. That means these species were brought into uh, captivity if needed to create re and be rewilded over time. Their habitat was protected. They stopped overhunting. These are all the common tools of conservation. But now as we enter into the 21st century, we have new conservation challenges. We have invasive species like never before with you know, the global traffic. We have novel wildlife diseases. We have smaller and smaller populations of endangered species losing genetic diversity. And all of that is compounded by climate change. And everyone in this room knows that the world is warming and even the latest uh, projections show that it's gonna get way worse before, uh, and we're gonna lose a tremendous loss of biodiversity along the way. Now, my background actually is in healthcare. I spent several decades in it, and I saw the Human Genome Project when it was launched, and I knew it was gonna be transformative for healthcare. I could see the emerging view of personalized medicine where we could have targeted therapeutics and precise diagnostics. And then we could see this happening with precision agriculture as well. And the foundation of that biotechnology platform really begins with genomic sequencing, high level sequencing and bioinformatics. And continued with advances in cell culturing, advances in advanced reproductive uh, techniques, and we could see at the time that genome editing was coming on the horizon quite fast with precision gene editing. But this platform had not yet been applied to conservation. And my husband, Stuart Brand, who's a co-founder of Revive and Restore, and I were, we were both thinking 10 some years ago, what if these tools could be used to help solve some of the emerging problems in conservation? And for those of you who know Stuart and the Long Now Foundation, you won't be surprised that he opined, well, you could probably even use these technologies to bring back an extinct species. And the passenger pigeon became one of our flagship projects. We started within the Long Now Foundation where this idea was incubated. And Stuart and I launched a series of, of meetings with scientists from around the world. We brought in genome engineers as social scientists and ethicists to weigh the, the benefits and the risk of these kinds of projects. And it became, became very clear that what we needed to do was actually start to socialize these ideas, that these tools were going to actually be used in conservation. And with that, we coined the term de-extinction, and we took it to a TED stage. We brought 18 scientists that were actually doing genome editing and beginnings of de-extinction work all over the world, we brought them to the stage where they could hash out some of these issues at National Geographic. Now, all along the way where we were creating this, we could see that these tools could be used all along the way to help endangered species. And with that, we actually named our organization Revive and Restore to keep our eye on the prize which was that it was really not just about reviving individual species, but it was really about ecological restoration. And the first chance we had to work on a project that, we, that was really so profound for our organization was with the black-footed ferret. We got a call from Fish and Wildlife, and we heard the story of the black-footed ferret. It used to range all across this landscape, across the Great Plains, from uh, Mexico to Canada. And that was until in the 1800s, this land actually became agricultural fields. And the uh, black-footed ferrets and their primary source of prey, which is the prairie dog, uh, were all literally exterminated. And by 1981, there were none. Until one small population was found in Matitsi, Wyoming. 
Wyoming Game and Fish brought that small population into captivity, bred them over time, and very successfully have reintroduced them to over 30 uh, sites back into their original range. However, over 30 years, all 10,500 ferrets have been bred in captivity from just a founder gene pool of seven ferrets that had been wild caught. Now, everybody knows that inbreeding is not a great thing. And when species get into smaller and smaller populations, they run the risk of going down the extinction vortex. When smaller populations cause greater uh, genetic drift, lower fertility counts, and even become more susceptible to wildlife diseases, increasing their mortality. Now, when we got the call from Fish and Wildlife to ask if we could help, we actually, you know, the first thing we said was, there are any other population that you can bring in to restore uh, genetic diversity? Because that's the typical tool in technology. Bring in a population from another area, and increase fertility, lower the mortality rate, increase the population, and becomes more stable. But there was no other population for the black-footed ferret. So we heard that within the San Diego frozen zoo, back 40 years ago, somebody was prescient enough to actually bank cell lines from two other individuals that had been wild caught in 1981, but had never contributed to the gene pool. With that, we did the genomic sequencing on those two cell lines, and we found that they carried up to three times more genetic diversity than any living ferret. So if we could actually clone those ferrets, we could start to build up that population, not by moving animals, but by moving genes. In, uh, by partnering with the San Diego Zoo and a, our partner Viagen uh, as a cloning company and with U.S. Fish and Wildlife <clears throat> under their permit, in 2020, we cloned Elizabeth Ann. She's the first, <laughs> she's the first endangered species in America to ever be cloned. Now, this is an amazing success story. And <laughs> And it was a first for conservation to actually use these technologies in this way. But to me, what's actually almost more amazing is the fact that scientists back in 1980s were prescient enough to start to think about cryopreservation. Now, cloning didn't exist then at all. They didn't know what they were gonna do with these cells. And that got us thinking, what else has been ever cryopreserved? It turns out that less than 14% of U.S. endangered species have any form of cryopreservation. That includes uh, plants and animals out of the 1,500. That's an alarming low number. And it's a particularly alarming low number when you realize the rate of extinction loss just in the last 100 years, and the trend keeps going up. So with that, we started talking with officials at Fish and Wildlife Service and we suggested to them that if we could figure out why this isn't happening, that we could actually help create protocols and, a, and a, actually a roadmap to help ensure that every species that is endangered in the US, and by the way, they are all on recovery plans for these animals. And the Fish and Wildlife Service has a responsibility to actually get them back off the list. We've said, why don't they just include in that whole process taking a cell culture and ensuring that they, uh, th that species has a reference genome that can be open access and used by researchers all over the world. So with this idea, we're trying to actually bank species for the present to help make better management decisions based on their DNA. But the truth is, they're really gonna be put in the bank to also help future generations with unknown technologies that are unthinkable today, but could we be transformative in the future? And here's our partner, Seth Willie. This is actually the same guy who called us to ask, could we help him with the black-footed ferret? 10 years later, Seth is a major partner in this whole initiative. You know, we're responsible in the Southwest region for about 200 threatened and endangered species nationwide. We're responsible for about 1,500 threatened and endangered species. 
And it got me wondering, you know, are we doing our part to set up future generations the same way somebody set up Blackbird and Ferret for that success 30 years before by biobanking, by cryogenically preserving that specimen, that sample? And the answer we came to was hit or miss. I mean, we're doing it in little bits here and there, you know, in conservation, if one of the first premises is save what you have, this is one tool that gives us that option to save what we have, not for academic purposes, but for recovery, for genetic rescue and uh, push species back to the point of being biologically viable. In this game, in conservation and endangered species recovery, we're entrusted to protect some of the nation's most valuable and unique biological resources. That conservation legacy is entrusted to us, and we're responsible for trying to arrest a species decline, to manage threats, and to bring species back from the brink. Genetic diversity took millions of years to evolve, and you know we're losing it on our watch. But it's not too late, right? There's still great opportunity for those critters and for many others. It's our responsibility to try to do what we can to save what's there today. So that's what we're doing. We've started this pilot with our first species. That's the Mexican wolf. It is native to New Mexico and Arizona. There are only 200 left in the wild today. And on a routine vet check last month, the field biologist team working with Revive and Restore, where we sent them a protocol and we sent them a tissue collection kit, actually was able to sample that Mexican wolf send off the sample to our culturing partner with Viagen, and it's now on its way for sequencing and will be going for long-term storage at a federal facility. So one down, we've got another 1,500 to do. So, you know, we've talked about cryopreservation with mammals, and we started there because really, to be quite honest, they're the easiest to do. The technology is well known how to cell culture. But for many organisms, it's incredibly hard. And we're working on uh, some innovative research to actually try to figure out a solution to that. But probably nothing is more important right now than working with coral. There are over 800 species of reef building corals. And coral reefs play such an incredible role in ecosystem. They support not only marine fishes, marine organisms and fish, mammals, they also provide Coral reefs provide incredible support to humans. They protect our shores, and they create the livelihood for over a billion people. And we're losing coral reefs at an alarming rate. Projections say by 2050, we may lose 90% of the coral reefs from bleaching. Now, bleaching is not always 100% extinction, because if coral have a chance to rebound the next year with cooler waters and less acidification, and, and no fishing trawling on them and everything else, if they don't have repeated insults, they can actually come back. And so we need to capture that biodiversity before it's really gone so that we can actually help bring those reefs back to fruition. And we're working right now with a project with Mary Hagerdorn, a leading scientist at the Smithsonian. Let's, let's hear from Mary. I've been working on the, the cryopreservation of marine species since um, 1993. And I realized it was going to be important because you could tell the oceans were going to be in trouble from climate change. Initially, when I started, I was really just trying to work out the science of how we do this. But then it became very clear that things were changing very rapidly and climate change and bleaching events were happening. And, you know, I became very worried that we needed to get this science done quickly I work on the conservation of coral, and I use human fertility techniques to do this. Basically, we are cryopreserving or freezing, however you want to think of it, um, gametes, the sperm and the larvae of coral, as well as small fragments of coral. And the reason we are interested in fusing cryopreservation is that it allows us to stop time, really. We can freeze coral and keep them for a day in our bank or 10 years, or 100 years, or 1,000 years. So it gives us the ability to use this material today or save it for many, many years in the future to potentially reseed the ocean. One of the major outcomes of our process is scalability. We want to be able to cryopreserve coral 
easily and cheaply so that every professional that wants to around the world can form their own cryopreserved banks of coral and thus speed up the process of securing the biodiversity and genetic diversity of coral. My hope for what we're doing is that these tools, these, these frozen assets that we're developing with cryopreservation can be used to help for restoration today, but also can be used to help reseed the oceans in the future. So Mary's project is one of eight that Revive and Restore is funding right now. We call it the Advanced Coral Toolkit. And we have researchers working at understanding the underlying genetics that allow some reefs to be resilient and, and uh, continue in, in the warming waters, some that may even show signs of resilience to disease. And coral disease is wiping out corals all the way from Florida right now down in, into the Caribbean with what's called coral stony loss disease. So as these scientists are working, they're developing the ability to create coral stem cells that could be used to repopulate reefs, as well as new techniques using proteomics and other parts of, uh, of, of research to figure out how to combine these tools so that we can actually make a big difference when we can take it, make an effort at restoration. Now we've talked about coral, um, We've talked about cryopreservation for a bit here, but I wanna make it really clear that one of the most simple and, and what should be a ubiquitous tool for conservation is genomic sequencing, that foundational level for everything. And as sequencing costs have plummeted over the years, this is a tool that I, I just wish more conservationists could actually access. Um, and we're doing it our effort to try to make it more ubiquitous. We have two projects I wanna talk about that I think are really exciting just in the way that they're using that genetic insight to make better management decisions around these endangered species. And the first one takes us uh, to Kenya with an Irishman named Andy Tai, who's been doing some incredible work. Arabuko is the largest remaining remnant of coastal forests in all of East Africa. Um, and it has a high degree of endemic species. And there's a population of elephants that are currently living in this forest, which in the past would have been connected to other populations of elephants, including those in Sabo and further north and further south. But now they're surrounded by an electric fence. Because it's such a dense environment, it's been very difficult to actually count how many elephants are in there. And it's very difficult to manage group of any animals if you don't know how many exist. Where this project is kind of pushing new boundaries is that this, this will be the first time a SNP array has been developed for savanna elephants. SNPs are single nucleotide polymorphisms. So basically one base pair in the genome where individuals differ. And when you amalgamate all those differences across an individual's genome, that pattern of SNPs is unique to the individual. So by using this approach, we can see how many individuals are in the forest. And the way that we're doing that is non-invasively using SCAP. In Arabuco, we have a unique situation where in the dry season, all of the elephants in the forest are forced to visit one watering hole. And what this means is that we can get a, a snapshot of every elephant in the forest as it comes to drink, it will relieve itself, and leave us a sample. And as we sample over the course of two or three weeks, we should in theory cover the entire population. Knowing this, wildlife authorities in Kenya will have a clear idea of the pressures that are on the forest. And if the number is quite high, it will indicate to wildlife authorities that perhaps some elephants should be translocated or a wildlife corridor should be put in, in a way almost like a release valve. But uh, a unique part of our project is that we are helping to develop a local lab in Kenya. And by having it based in country, it means that these sorts of projects could be happening with much higher frequency and are reliant on people like me flying in, facilitating stuff like this. Ideally, in the future, human civilization will have space for nature, but at the moment it's a fight. So areas like Arabuco, Sokoke need to be protected in their entirety, which includes the elephants and all the other animals that are in there. So that in the future, when we have space and, and tolerance, they'll be able to spread out 
Uh, this is true of all wild places around the world. What I love about that project is that these elephants um, are absolutely invisible from the sky. And, you know, elephants don't like drones either. But even if you could, you could not see them as much from the air. So they really don't know the size of the population and they don't know the level of inbreeding that could be happening in a closed population. So by looking at that individual fingerprint of those animals, they not only know their genetic diversity, but they will begin to even understand what plants they're eating and how they might even create a migratory path for them, a wildlife corridor that actually would be um, of, the, of the right plants uh, for the elephants. Now, using genomic insight has a, uh, a very different take in a very interesting situation close to our home here in California. And we're gonna go to our California kelp forest. This is a healthy kelp forest. And this is the way it used to be from Baja, California to Alaska. Rich, diverse ecosystem, once again, creating the, like a coral reef, creating the habitat for millions of organisms and nurturing mammals along the way, like the sea otter that wraps itself up in kelp when it goes to sleep to help uh, keep sharks at bay. Now what creates this healthy ecosystem is the sea star. There are eight different species of sea stars all up along the coast where they should be. And they got hit very hard by an unknown invasive pathogen, and it's called sea star wasting disease. And it absolutely disintegrates these sea stars. Now, the billions of sea stars used to be here until 2013. And what is replacing them is all purple sea urchins. Now the sea urchins and the sea stars once lived uh, in balance. But once they got removed, it just became urchin barrens. It's been, it's been identified that we've lost 95% of our kelp all along this West Coast. It's a horrific number. These are the bull kelp, the ones that should be like a forest. And these urchin barrens um, are terrifying, particularly because they can last for up to 50 years. They just go dormant. They don't have anything to eat. They get, just get, you know, uh, they're, you know, they're not good for anything. <laughs> and even though we think of urchin, for those of us who eat sushi and things like that, we think of uni and, oh my gosh, that could, should be a great resource. Why don't we just harvest them? There is a company that's trying to do that. But the truth is there's, they're so starved in this environment right now that the only way to commercialize them is to put them in captive breeding and feed them and then try to sell them to the Japanese market. It's a crazy, horrible situation. And right now there's a lot of different ideas of how to remove these uh, urchins. There's an urchin barren that can be seen that is 400 miles long off our coast from Marin County to the Oregon border. So right now there are commercial divers that are vacuuming them up, there are uh, volunteers are scuba diving and picking them up. There's robots that are being deployed. There's lots of technology. But there's one technology when it was proposed to us for research that we thought biotech might have a solution. And I'm going to let Mike Dawson tell that story. The question for us was, is there a way to reintroduce the sunflower sea star to California, Oregon and Washington? and to help those populations that are reintroduced be more resilient to future change, right? Whether that's changes in ocean temperature, ocean acidification, or other outbreaks of wasting disease. And so the way we approach this essentially was to try to work out what diversity was remaining or what diversity had survived after, after the wasting disease. And having identified those portions of the genome, we're developing a way to rapidly assess the diversity of genomes to identify which animals should have a tendency to be resilient to wasting disease. We're now collaborating with a team in Washington to use the information that we have about the genomics 
in a breeding program to restore populations in the wild. With Nature Conservancy, we're now actually collaborating to try to do that part of it. The next part of that project will be to take the tools that we're developing with Revive and Restore into that actually more you know, real applied setting that has been the long-term goal. We've become more willing to try technical solutions to conservation problems in part because we've just learned a huge amount more about marine systems in the last several decades. You know, over that same period of time, two to three decades, we and the general population become much, much more aware about how severe the current threats actually are. So the need for action. And so the idea is that by restoring populations to sea stars, we would also be able to help build the resilience of kelp forest ecosystems. So I think this is a great example of biotechnology being an interesting part of the solution. But let's be clear, it's not going to be the magic fix. It's going to take all kinds of innovation and technology from robots to aerial surveys to, you know, divers actually removing them uh, in great quantities. But it's the combination, it's the integration of these technologies that is starting to happen that is exactly why we started this organization. But let's talk about birds now. <laughs> One in eight species of birds are threatened with, globally with extinction. It's an alarming number. Half of them are in decline. In Hawaii alone, Hawaii has lost 75% of their endemic species. Some of that is due to climate change, habitat loss, but it's also due to avian disease. We've been trying to figure out how to use some of the technologies that we're using in mammals, as in cloning, to actually influence and help this solve some of these challenges with birds. But the problem with the bird is it has a very unique reproductive system. The embryo is tucked inside, inside the egg. And the egg is a huge barrier. Mammals with uteruses are actually easy to manipulate, it turns out. And what it's going to take to change and actually develop advanced reproductive technologies for birds is different. It's called germline transfer. And it's actually been done successfully in the poultry industry with, with chickens. And what we're trying to do is learn from that technology and to apply it for endangered birds. We've just um, announced a program called Biotechnology for Bird Conservation, and we have eight international teams working on this exact problem. They're taking different paths. They're, some of them are incredibly synergistic and some of them will be sequential, but all of them are working together to actually solve this challenge. The way it would be done is you would take those primordial germ cells from the endangered bird and you would transfect them into a domestic surrogate, in this illustration, into both sexes of the chicken. And the offspring would actually be the wild bird, just like we did with the ferret. We used a domestic ferret to have a wild black-footed ferret. If we could do that, you could actually repopulate some of these small, limited, endangered populations because those common birds could actually have multiple chicks and multiple times a year. Whereas the endangered birds, if they're lucky, they get two or three chicks a year, maybe one or two survive, and you can't rebuild the population. I'm going to introduce Eric Jarvis, one of our scientists that we're working with, at Rockefeller University. My main line of research is understanding brain mechanisms of vocal learning, the ability to imitate sounds like we do uh, for speech. And there are only a few species that have this ability besides us humans, like songbirds and parrots and whales. And as I started to get involved in comparing the brains and genomes of multiple species, I started to realize that a number of them I wanted to study are critically endangered. And that got me more involved also in conservation because I feel like it's a moral duty for us scientists to get involved. Maintaining bird cells, the germ cells that is, for whatever reason, is harder to do than the equivalent cells for mammals. Uh, there's something about bird cells that they need to be inside the egg in order to develop properly than in a culture dish. My lab and many other labs are trying to figure out what is the magic sauce that these bird cells need 
that we've already figured out for mammals, but not for birds yet. And when you think once we figure it out for birds, it's going to be the same for reptiles because the birds are basically reptiles and they have the same egg laying kind of system. A lot of folks think that conservation should be only about trying to put fences up to save species from population decline and not really get into the biology of you know, diseases of these animals or the genetics and so forth. I often have to explain to conservation-minded folks that putting up fences is not enough. With small population size comes the prevalence for more susceptibility to disease. Human population growth is going to continue to grow. We must find modern means to live in coexistence with species without causing their extermination. And so for my efforts in conservation, I'm doing them not only because I'm fascinated by the science, but also because I feel like it's necessary. It's necessary for our survival. And the truth is, if Eric Jarvis and the other scientists that we're working with are actually successful, someday we might even have back the passenger pigeon. And when we do, there could well be another iconic species that was lost, and that's the American chestnut tree, and it's coming back. These are American chestnuts. They used to rain down from these enormous trees all across the eastern forest. I hope you're seeing those little people under that huge tree. There were billions of these trees all across this range. By the 1850s, a blight came in from the landscaping trade that absolutely decimated these trees. It was called chestnut tree blight. And all that's left all across that range is just the ghost of those roots. Sometimes they sprout up, but they never really come to any significant fruition. The good part of the story is that for the last 30 years, there have been scientists at State University of New York that have been trying to figure out how they can create a chestnut tree that is blight resistant, and they've succeeded. Um, it's really incredible what they've done, and they've done it with one trans gene from wheat. By creating and transfecting this gene into wheat, they've made a blight resistant chestnut tree. Now his team has had to go through incredible hurdles to bring this tree through the regulatory path because it is the first genetically engineered wild species. They've been planting these trees in experimental plots. The regulators have made them go through every single uh, experiment to demonstrate that they carry no safety risk because at the end of the day, those chestnuts might be eaten by people and animals alike. This is, Bill Powell. He's the scientist who has pushed this forward. And he's really been a model for Revive and Restore. And the part that I particularly love about his story and, and why we didn't have to fund them, all we had to do was just advocate for the tree, is because he actually was transparent about the research that he was doing from the beginning. He mobilized a whole American Chestnut Tree Foundation movement. And with that support, they've been able to go through that regulatory process. And I believe this year is the year that these trees will be commercially available. Now, they're going to, smart, they're going to start with small introduction of the trees for sale. Ideally, they'll begin with uh, in biological reserves and botanical gardens and other areas just to get them really established back in their range. But they are coming to every backyard gardener in their original historic range soon. Now, Revive and Restore has been involved over the last 10 years on 54 projects. And we've been funding projects in 16 nations. And those projects are focused on 70 wild species. But wild species don't live in a vacuum. They require healthy ecosystems, and those ecosystems include people, their culture, and their values. Now, we were really excited when we heard that there was a project 
called One People, One Reef, operating in the middle of the Western Pacific in Micronesia. And what excited us about this project was the fact that it was trying to combine traditional law, traditional knowledge with modern science with indigenous people. Let's hear from Magul Rumal. We're, uh, we're from the Eton of Yulifi. It's part of the Yap state in the chain of what we call the outer islands. And it's basically about a stretch of 99 islands in Micronesia. We're, we're very subsistence community. We depend so much on maybe 90% on our resources, our local resources. So we still grow our own food with very little import. I think like many, many people, many, many coastline communities, we are facing climate change. And that's no surprise to everybody, but definitely not for us. We used to be able to predict certain birds and certain fish migrate associated with these weather patterns and those associated stars that we call the, the traditional markers. Now, these patterns have changed quite a bit. And we can't depend so much on, on traditional knowledge because it's changed. And so I think that acceptance of that and that willingness to, to seek further or new information kind of started earlier on. We need to seek more information because it's moving much faster than we ever know. So it takes science. It takes you know genomics and, and DNA that is now collected to the way that more accurate count of assessing the reef health and the fish count. It takes that kind of science and knowledge to be able to help us make a decision on management. We've seen positive changes in combining these wisdoms of the West and, and traditional knowledge and coming up with creative ways to adapt to the fast decline in, in some areas. I think that the responsibility now in my mind is to spread this through the region on low, low lying communities like us to join the efforts and see from the 10 years of data of how we can and we will be able to, to fight some of these fast changing decline in our reefs and resources. Now the challenges that Magul and his people are facing may seem very remote to everybody sitting in this room. But I suspect that most of you don't realize that we actually do impact endangered species in ways that you may not even think of it. This is a blue bottle. It's actually called blue blood. And probably everyone in this room has benefited from this substance. It's harvested every year from horseshoe crabs. 400,000 crabs a year are harvested on the East Coast. They're impaled in these factories where one third of their blood is drained. And the reason that you've benefited from this is because of that blue protein. It is used for every drug, injectable drug or vaccine that you've ever had or anyone you know to make them safe, safe from the impurities in the manufacturing process that could come in from bacteria in the water. That LAL substance it's referred to is the gold standard for drug manufacturing today. And it's used with not only drugs and vaccines, with every implanted device. And it's used even in veterinary medicine. But here's where the horseshoe crab lives. This species comes in once a year on the high tides of May and June to spawn. And it spawns in the thousands of eggs every year. And it provides not only for the proliferation of its species, but also as sustenance for wild birds and a whole ecosystem. And these wild birds in particular, this is the red knot, they migrate all the way from the tip of South America all the way to the Arctic Circle. And they make one pit stop in Delaware Bay to refuel on the eggs of the horseshoe crab. Now these species are being listed, they're endangered. They're not making it to the Arctic Circle and when they're making it to the Arctic Circle, those that do are so thin and underfed that they usually are not breeding. 
this is a multi-continent ecological problem. And it's something that is done for the welfare of humanity. That's why it's so linked to everything that we do. But it doesn't have to be that way. And that's where synthetic biology comes in. Scientists back in 1995 at the University of Singapore, Dr. Ling and Dr. Ho, actually identified that unique protein in the horseshoe crab that they make the LAL substance from. And that unique protein was synthesized and has been created what we call the recombinant factor C. That RFC has languished on the market because of corporate greed, because there's so much money in the blood of the horseshoe crab. And it's also because of bureaucratic inertia and regulatory inertia. We don't have any financial arrangement in this. We're not a supporter at one way or another of the pharmaceutical industry. But to be really clear, we've been advocating for the pharmaceutical companies to do something, to adopt this synthetic alternative, to force the regulatory authorities to do something. We and other conservation groups have organized a coalition and we've sent letters ad nauseum. But one really bold scientist from Eli Lilly has changed the whole dynamic. Before I go to Jay, I should say a little bit about how endotoxin, which is what this testing of impurities, uh, it, the history about it. It used to be in 1942 that drug manufacturers used rabbits to test for any kind of impurity. By 1965, they learned about the, uh, the horseshoe crab blood with this unique property for early detection. And within 12 years, that got approved by regulators and it became the gold standard. Today, recombinant factor C has been on the market for close to 30 years. And the only way a drug manufacturer can use it is by jumping through an incredible amount of hurdles to demonstrate that added safety. And one bold company with one bold scientist has changed that up, and that's Jay Bolden. I, I'm a birder, so I have a unique perspective in that I can see the impact of the horseshoe crab, not only because of the horseshoe crab itself, but the the species that rely on it, including birds and turtles and sport fish and all, you know, anything that's in the ecosystem that it's impacting. And so we were aware at Lilly that there was an alternative to the, to the LAL test reagent. We generated the data, but it took a lot of alignment internally. And then externally, we had to convince the FDA and uh, other health authorities around the world. But we did that with our data and we convinced them we drew a line in the sand in 2016, and we said that all new drugs that are manufactured at Lilly, we would apply the common factor C to them. And so our first product was approved in 2018, and that was a milestone because that was a first in industry approval of any medicine using RFC for release. And then we've subsequently had six additional product approvals since then, including our three COVID-19 antibodies. Our goal when we set out was to convert all eight of our manufacturing quality control labs at the time to RFC, and we've done that. And it's been industries following. We have, we have our peers, Sanofi and Pfizer and Roche Genentech have all come out and made statements similar to what we've done, which is that we'll convert our water testing and all of our new product testing. So there's definitely a movement towards more sustainable endotoxin testing. We look forward to progress everywhere that will make it easier for all companies who have to test for endotoxins to be able to do so using a sustainable alternative to LAL. One footnote on that. America truly is lagging behind on this adoption. Europe, Japan, Korea have all adopted the standards to approve RFC and testing. It's really our country that is the problem. The horseshoe crab has been around for 445 million years. It's seen 
it, basically it looks exactly the same as it did as a living as a fossil now we can tell that it hasn't changed very much it survived five mass extinctions from volcanic eruptions climate change asteroids and it's not until the last 100 years that humans have threatened it with extinction i believe that when humans cause the problem we have a responsibility to create solutions. If we look back 10,000 years, the world was a very different planet. There was much more biodiversity, more kinds of creatures, and much greater amount of biodiversity, many more animals and plants and other organisms. But because of our human presence, we have actually closed out so many of those opportunities to let those species thrive. We're at a point in time where I think that by com combining both conventional approaches to conservation along with new technologies and biotechnology, that we can actually envision a much richer, more bioabundant bio future. The truth is, it takes time to make changes happen in conservation. The conservationists that we work with, in some cases, they have to work at the pace of nature. But the truth is, they all live in the long now. And we're all looking to, to see how we can build a better future. Thank you. Have a seat. Yeah. I've got about three hours of questions here. <laughs> oh, boy, I get to see everybody. Oh, yes. So we can sort of hardly kind of see you all. Um, uh, but they're there. Trust me. I, a question occurred to me as you were talking about the adorable horseshoe crabs. <laughs> um, and we've talked about terms at Long Now before. Is living fossil a wrong term? Well, it's interesting. I guess I use it because it looks exactly like the fossil. And so it seems like a living fossil. But, you know, you can correct me. Fossil, no, but I'm just, I'm just, it had not occurred to me. You said the fossil sort of evokes something that's like, well, you know, long it's, gone. it's like a guest who's been too long at yeah. a cocktail party. Um, I mean, Stuart, Stuart will put you to work on thinking about this. What's a better term? Is, you know, something about biological elders or the like. But I better get to, my job is to ask questions of other people and not ask my own. So I'll save that for later. <laughs> um, and Kevin's done a wonderful job on the, well, in fact, I'm going to ask uh, a Kevin Kelly, Ke Kevin Kelly question. Yeah. Um, what a what, surprise. A Kevin Kelly question. Kevin, Kevin asks, always has great so questions. So every time we do this, I just always determine I'm never going to ask a Kevin question, but he asks such good questions. Okay, go ahead. What kind and range of money would be needed to run a national biobank with samples of all the endangered species? It's such a damn good question, Kevin. And it's one that I don't have an answer for. Um, but I know it'll take an act of Congress to get federal dollars to do it, and we should get that through congressional dollars. Um, I am talking to people at the national offices about this, of, of what it would take. So I'll tell you, the federal storage facilities are there. The databasing infrastructure is more or less there. The challenge of getting field biologists to actually add this extra step in their process it's not a big deal. They actually like doing it. They understand the value. And in many cases, it's, it's a one-off. I mean, they may get one at a time. Um, the, the cell culturing with mammals, not a big deal. So, you know, probably a, a million going into new research on cell culturing is definitely a number that is going to have to happen. And that could be for um, birds as well as uh, other species. But I think the biggest challenge is actually getting the mandate to do it. 
And my goal is to actually get it written into these recovery plans, which the biologists have to do as part of their work. It's, you know, this is their job in the U.S. is to protect these endangered species. And this is our American legacy, if we do it right. So you lost me at Act of Congress. No. Oh. I mean, is, Why? I, mean I, I wouldn't seriously propose that genetic engineering could solve our problem of members of Congress, but... <laughs> Um, no, no, it was the biobanking of the indigenous. I know, but, I, but no, I'm, I'm, I'm going somewhere with this. You, you give the example of where you've worked with other organizations to help accelerate acceptance and to overcome things that just yes. seemed... What, what are, in the political realm, what are things that need to be done? Maybe not by revive and restore, but you, you said conservation takes time. And that's correct. Um, what would speed it up? I, I'm not so sure that it needs to speed up in some ways. You know, this is this is working at the pace of nature. Um, there's plenty of bureaucracy that I'd like to to speed up, and um, but but I think that it, it, it's actually been a kind of a healthy thing. You know, when Stuart and I started this, we wanted to socialize these ideas, to have public dialogue about it, and um, I think I think that's been good for the culture. People need to, to actually realize how important these technologies can be and to integrate them. A very long, nowish answer. <laughs> um, two closely related questions here. Um, and I'm going to start with Jenny, uh, and then I'll ask the second one, which is anonymous. Which conservation organizations in Revive and Restore, um, or which conservation is Revive and Restore currently partnering with and or which would you seek to partner with in the future? And part two of that is how do you find and choose your projects and partners? And how do you support them? What are the ways you support them? So um, probably the, the biggest bang for our buck of all of those projects is just enabling genomic sequencing. Some of those projects, we may fund $50,000 grants, some of them 250,000, a few, up to a million over three years kind of thing. But it's really getting these foundational tools into their hands. And that's something that is just gonna get cheaper to do. And ultimately you won't need Revive and Restore to do that because they'll be able as a conservation organization or land stewards to be able to just make that happen on their own. But for now, we're kind of a gateway for a lot of these organizations at that front. The bigger projects, like the engineering, you know, really thinking about how to advance reproduction for birds, those are much bigger projects. Now, back to the question of conservation organizations. When we think about how we're making a difference, our goal isn't to, um, it, our goal isn't just to try these ideas, move the science forward. It's actually to integrate it into a functioning ecosystem. And we are never gonna be in a position to do that. We need the nature conservancies of the world to take those genetically uh, resilient sea stars, captive breed them, and reintroduce them to the wild. That's a huge process that has to happen by other organizations, not us. So we're the kind of bleeding edge, try it, de-risk ideas, organization, enable people to start to use these tools and hope that they get translated out to, you know, the big NGOs. So when you're starting a relationship, you've been around for 10 years now, what does the arc of the beginning of the relationship, how do they typically happen and how does it yeah. evolve and when does it take off? Well, we've done a really fun thing that it, we didn't know if it would work very well, but we called it, um, we started a program three years ago called Wild Genomes. And we asked for people to apply for uh, research money to do sequencing on endangered or threatened species. But we put a very important uh, requirement in it that it had to be actionable, that it couldn't be just purely academic. It had to be something information that once they gleaned from the genome, that they could apply in a way 
that it could actually help protect the species. And so, you know, we've had way more proposals than we could ever fund. So we're looking for funding partners now as we build out that program. And so right now we have a, uh, it, we just finished an open call around kelp ecosystems. And we did that in partnership with the Morris Animal Foundation and, um, and the Webb Family Foundation. And so they're kind of co-partners in it. And we actually have joint calls and we have advisory boards that select the projects um, uh, in a really good, healthy functioning partnership. So I hope we can do more of that with funders. What about citizens at large? Where does About what? citizen science fit in? Yeah, you know, there's wonderful citizen science going on. And they are um, in, in, in incredible new force, I think, on, on the horizon. Um, we know one of, the, uh, one of the organizations, I think it's called Adventure Scientists, that is doing cool things. But, um, and we're not the scientists. So we're letting, the way that we hear about some of these projects where scientists are coming to us, who are really doing the work um, and we fund them to do the work. And in a case of like Andy Ty in Dublin, we're actually helping him fund that capacity to create those labs on site in Kenya. And I love that part of it. Um, other projects we envision on our own with the black-footed ferret, uh, the person who came to us was US Fish and Wildlife. They didn't really have the solution. We had to come up with it. And then we built the team around it. And we're continuing to do that with the, bir with the work on the birds. By the way, I should credit Jean Trombley was one who asked that question. Thank you, Jean. Thank you, and Jean. a question for the audience. Who here has a, uh, uh, has a garage genome sequencing lab? <laughs> Andrew, do you want to raise your hand? There's at least one in this room. Did I see another hand show up? Good. And, and has anybody uh, managed to buy? I, I want you to know that uh, somebody in the audience I happen to know is Giacomo from One People, One Reef. And I forget the statistic he gave me, but he just completed at least two fish genomes out on a reef uh, in the outer islands uh, in like a clinical facility or something. Like, it was like a crazy, crazy situation. And he did it. Yeah, well, I mean. So it's happening. What's the going rate for thermocyclers on eBay these days? <laughs> Seriously, Andrew, what, 200 bucks? About 200 bucks. I mean, you, how much would it cost to, sorry, to put you on the spot, what would it cost to build a lab in a garage? This is great. So everybody who has a teenage male uh, who's Female. not quite properly Careful. socialized, if you're a grandparent, this is how you terrify the parents, is you, you buy them a genome kit to run in the garage. What could possibly go wrong? Speaking of which, we have a question about unintended consequences. Mm, I love that. Yes. So first of all, um, I, I really like to flip that question and say, what about the intended consequences? Do you want me to ask the question? Oh, well, go ahead. <laughs> Just say it. I'm just uh, cutting to this, the is, case. this is from uh, uh, Anonymous, who's very oh. prolific in this audience. Um, quote, restore. Uh, to which benchmark point do you restore to? How do you decide what the state is? Now, that doesn't have anything to do with unintended. Okay, well, never mind. Talk about unintended consequences. <laughs> well, I have to talk about intended consequences because in the last 10 years, I always get the question of, you know, we don't know about the unknown unknowns. And yeah, that's right, we don't. But we got to flip that question and say, what about the benefits of trying things? I mean, when I first started talking to coral biologists, and this was really early on, and we could see what was going on with global warming, almost everyone I talked to said, it is so desperate, Ryan. I mean, they were like going through PTSD diving. And they said, it's so radical, we don't dare do anything to risk the unintended consequences of meddling with the reefs. And that has really flipped in the last five years. Mary Hagerdorn and all the scientists that we're funding, they're actually saying we have to intervene. We may not have to genetically engineer, we may take those corals that are doing well on one part of a reef, and we may translate them to another part where they could still do better, or we could, you know, 
help with breeding and, and repopulating, but some of them are actually open to where the technology will take them in order to save the reefs. So I think it's the risk benefit equation that has to be played out. And um, it just depends on people's tolerance. And I've seen that tolerance shift. Um, where's Isabella? No, nah, Isabella okay. Kirkland. Yeah, so Isabella Kirkland. Me... So who was familiar with Isabella's art before this evening? Show of hands. Oh, yeah. yeah. The rest of you, after this evening is, is over, do not walk, run to your nearest web browser. These are the most <laughs> exquisitely beautiful paintings, and they're just chock full of information. So Isabella had a, a rather plaintive mm. one-word question. Oh. Plants, question mark, question mark. Are, are we engaged in... <laughs> Some, some species chauvinism here? Yeah, actually we are. Izzy, you really put me on the spot there. Well, we don't have a specific project on plants except the Joshua tree. The Joshua tree, which, pardon? It will, but the chestnut is, is not technically our project. I just am a huge advocate for it. And as I said, it's been a model for, for us for all these years. But the Joshua Tree is a project that we've been funding. Again, funding starting with the genomic sequencing to understand how this tree can actually adapt with climate change. It is not going to make it where it is, for sure. But what they do know is that some of these trees are showing some resilience to warming uh, temperatures. And so they're doing the experimentation to see if they could actually move those trees to another location based on that resilience. Um, and, and certainly, Izzy, to answer your question, that m more than any species that's been cryopreserved have been plants, either in seed banks or in cryo facilities. So that's kind of the easier one to tackle. But um, you know, the chestnut tree is a model for so many trees that are near and dear to us here in California, with sudden oak death, with Hawaii, uh, you know, there, there is no end of pathogens affecting these beautiful 100, 200 year old trees and more. And they're invasive pathogens. They don't belong in the environment. This is not kind evolution happening. Forget climate change. I was just thinking, how do you save the, the Joshua trees from all the hipsters well, there's moving that into the desert? But that's I know. another story. I read about the Joshua tree, and I think, oh, God, what can biotech do with all the other problems? Um, uh, question for the audience. So who here, uh, who here took organic chemistry in college? Oh, wow. Right. And so forget you, we're going to ignore. <laughs> uh, everybody else, who here feels just like, I mean, you know that this is important, otherwise you wouldn't be here. But genetics, genomics, and it all reminds you of those unpleasant college experiences and you're just a little intimidated by it. Is there anybody in the room like that? No, nobody's raising their hands. Cool. <laughs> This is such a cool audience. Okay, well, never mind. I was going to ask you to talk a little bit about, you know. No, good. Let's ignore that. But I'm going to ask you the question anyway. I didn't take those classes. You know, I'm just an entrepreneur. and um, She's also not good at pool, but she likes to play for money. Go ahead. Are, we, are we out of questions? I have a question. No, I have a question for you. Um, everybody leaves this tonight, and they talk to their friends about what's going on. What's an easy way to talk about the science to make it not seem forbidding? Huh. Gosh, I thought I did that. <laughs> well, nobody raised their hand, so clearly we're... <laughs> uh, uh, okay, so Kev I give up. Kevin has a question. What, what is a tool or technology that seems almost possible that would make your mission easier? Stem cell technology. I have a really good answer for that one. So one of the things that I'm learning, and again, this is kind of drafting be behind human medicine, is that stem cell technology is changing everything in human medicine. I mean, 
you know, what did I just read the other day that stem cells were being used? You know, th these are cells that are taken from your own body that are then implanted to reduce inflammation or to, you know, to help with Parkinson's, all these different applications. But understanding how to develop those stem cells has been incredibly hard. Now, they've never been used for conservation, not really. And so because of that, um, Revive and Restore is going to host this fall a workshop. And I've invited now uh, probably 20 different scientists that are doing stem cell research in all different fields from veterinary medicine. Stem cells are big with horses. I'm an equestrian. I can tell you many high performance horses get stem cell injections. They, they do these things first with animals and they do it with prized cattle and prized horses. Um, and then they work it down to humans. I want to work it the other way and work it for wildlife. So we're going to gather these scientists together and we're going to do a format that I've used in other workshops, which is really interesting. Um, we've done it now, I think, four different times on different topics. And the secret to the success of this, and it really has been a success, is we get you know, 30, 40 different people from very different disciplines to all work over three days, night and day, in a retreat facility. And we give them three different challenges that they all buy into. They elect and opt in to different work groups. And at the end of the three days, they're supposed to identify the problem, identify the solution, develop a roadmap on how to get there, and develop what they think could be the translational partners to make it happen, and the funders. And then I have a mock group of funders who were present on the third day of the workshop. And I can tell you, the night before, these teams stay up half the night trying to get their decks together. And they pitch it as if for real. And what has happened on numerous of these workshops, the funders stepped up. And incredible research has moved forward, one in particular on gene drives for rodents on islands. It was incubated at one of our workshops. And so I want to do that with stem cells because no one's paying attention to it. And it's the secret ingredient that will allow all of these different projects to move forward for engineering. Wow. <laughs> Does this thing have a name? Uh, well, it, it doesn't have a good name. It's called the Stem Cell Workshop for Wildlife. <laughs> How about BioCharette? Oh, I'm going to work on that. Yeah. Yeah, no, I need I mean, a better name. Taking but, that notion of the artist Charette. But better. it's really great. Yesterday I was on the phone at 6 o'clock with Singapore. Singapore is big on stem cell research, and I've got three institutions um, already lined up to participate. Wow. wow. I just need the funders. <laughs> um, funders in the audience? Yeah. Uh, Reach up to right there. Um, Dov has a question. Is it possible, you, you, you answered this partly in your talk, but I, I think they're saying, can you push it further? Dov says, is it possible to use gene editing to create artificial genetic diversity for threatened populations? I don't think I really understand that. Artificial, yeah, say it again. Or, um, or Dov, are you? Yeah. Stand up and shout. Yeah, I think I, I think I can answer that Thank question you. that I don't know that I would use it artificial, but one idea early on was um, that black-footed ferrets are actually very susceptible to plague. That's a whole other problem I don't want to depress you with, uh, and it's ubiquitous across the Great Plains. But um, some species are resilient to plague, and so looking at the domestic ferret, which is re resistant to plague, and trying to figure out, is there a gene that you could knock in that maybe has gone silent over the years in the black-footed ferret or was never there? Could you engineer in that gene? And, um, and, and that is a, you know, something that we are thinking about um, in different ways. But 
to answer your question about artificial, I think it's important to think about the role of synthetic biology because um, you know, creating novel organisms has happened and will continue to happen. Our feeling about novel organisms is that there's plenty of existing organisms to work with. We don't have to really create new ones. We're trying to help save and protect those that exist. But um, being able to turn back on genes, some people call them lost alleles, that have disappeared over time, I think is a very interesting uh, potential. Hold on, sorry. sorry. I agreed to moderate it on the condition. I was still allowed to take notes, which is what I like That's to do amazing. when I listen to Ryan. Um, so here's a question from June. Uh, and I'm sorry, who is it from? June. June. Um, and I'm going to ask his question, but then I'm going to modify it. How would the common birds nurture the endangered bird chicks? Mm. So my build on this is, who here remembers reading The Ugly Duckling as a child? Yeah. So... Here's this mom sitting on an egg, and it hatches, and she goes, I don't recognize that. I mean, are the birds surprised? Well, it's interesting. You or know, is it all in incubators? So it, it, it's mostly in incubators. Uh, we haven't succeeded with it with birds, so I don't have personal experience. But I can tell you that the domestic ferrets absolutely nurtured the wild black-footed ferrets as if their own. And, uh, and, and black-footed ferrets, I don't know if I told you, they are serious carnivores. Um, and, you know, they've got some of the longest teeth of any of the mammals. Um, and those domestic ferrets took them on like their own. So it happens in nature all the time. Surrogacy. Yeah. Right. I mean, I, and some bird species make a business out of that. Yes, they do. Some of them do make a business uh, out of it. They'll remain unnamed, of course. <laughs> Those um, bad ones. So uh, going down that path a little further, is, can the same, there, there was a question that Kevin, I peeked at it, but he didn't give it to me. Um, but I remember it was someone asking, could this technology be used to stop invasives? Like, oh, yeah. could we do something with the Florida python? Well, God, I really wanted to do something. Uh, it, it's a huge challenge reproductively with the python. Um, so the technology that exists that's been worked on with rodents is called the gene drive. And it, what a gene drive does is it perpetuates very quickly a particular gene selection through reproduction. And what, when that happens, you could basically create sterility. Now, everybody is very concerned about a gene drive for one species, for example, getting rid of rodents on an island by introducing only males, right? You could just get that selection through and all of a sudden you've decreased your population. But what if that rodent escapes off the island and then affects the good rodents other places? That's the big fear. So scientists are working on trying to figure out ways to create um, both uh, self-limiting gene drives, and, and they have lots of different approaches to this, so that that unintended consequence doesn't happen, even should an, an, an engineered animal escape. But to me, it's one of the most humane things we can do, because what we do for these species, like killing thousands of Burmese pythons every year in Florida, um, if we could create sterility and remove them, it would be a much more humane thing to do. Uh, using rodenticides on islands has had huge mortality on other species, especially uh, raptors who eat, eat those, um, you know, sick and dying and dead rodents, uh, and they ingest the rodenticide. So, you know, working with invasive species is huge. Now, where they're making progress with this because I, I need to give you more success stories. Yeah, which are just a little... This is a good one. Oh, oh sorry. It's, it was, a, it's it, a good success story. Okay. So um, Hawaii had mosquitoes introduced. I think it was in the 50s. I, I didn't study that stat, but in the 1950s, 1850s. Oh, yeah, they came in. They definitely came in uh, with the whalers, and they came in and, sh and shipped ballast and everything else. 
Those mosquitoes should never be in Hawaii. There are five species of Hawaii in Hawaii, some that carry uh, human pathogens like chikungunya and yellow fever and all these other things. But there's another horrific one that carries avian malaria. That's what those honey creepers died of. And it is causing extinction like nothing else. The big challenge is as these island temperatures rise, the birds who used to seek a refuge at higher altitudes where the mosquitoes don't go, now they can't go any higher and the mosquitoes are going as high as they can. So there's no mountaintop to escape to. So um, people in Hawaii have known this problem and they love their birds and they've been completely conflicted about what to do with it. This is the, the animal-human conflict that just keeps playing out. And um, so, the, in, so gene drives were proposed. I was one of the ones who did workshops in Hawaii and just they just went, you know, GMO, forget it. Um, but there is a solution, and there are folks um, that came out of uh, Google X Labs that have used what they are calling an organic substance called Wolbachia that they can engineer into the mosquitoes that causes infertility in the mosquito. And also, because of uh, their incredible AI expertise, they've been able to uh, in grow these mosquitoes in great quantity because they can use AI to sex select, something that, you know, we haven't talked about the role of AI in all this, but it's just going to be really transformative for things like captive breeding of small insects and everything else. And uh, Wolbachia is now being set for trials in certain islands. It's really worked its way through from, I think, having the scariest idea of a gene drive to something that now is being called organic, being passable. But at the end of the day, it is engineered and it, it, uh, it will not absolutely knock out the population of mosquitoes. It will just drive them down and they're gonna have to keep reintroducing these mosquitoes over time. You know, some years ago, I was absolutely startled when E.O. Wilson confessed <laughs> that if all the all the mosquitoes disappeared from the world, he would not object. I mean, was, yeah. is this biological extremism? Well, you know, there. Look, I was a big proponent. I did a workshop, and I I, I called it um, um, mosquito-free Hawaii. I just I, I wanted to get them all. Well, getting off Hawaii makes sense if they were invasive, yeah. but off the entire planet. No, uh, but you know, um, it, it's it, it's complicated. Yeah. There, are, you know, many many species of mosquito. They're not all right. bad. It is not a charismatic species. Um, <laughs> you know, Kevin's earlier question about a technology that you can't leave yet. Don't look at your watch. I'm just. I want to make sure everybody's okay. Yeah. No, we're, you guys just, okay? Yeah. <laughs> I love this audience. I love I'm, I'm going to do a check-in in about 10 minutes with the audience. Okay. See. But, okay. but in the meantime, don't go anywhere. Um, Kevin asked the question about technology that's right on the edge of being useful. And you mentioned stem cells, but it seems like AI is definitely in that category. It is. And I don't know that much about it. And I need to learn more. And Computer I'm scientists don't either, so. I, I'm following your advice, Kevin, on AI and links that you've sent me. But I asked the people who are working with uh, us on this concept of the stem cell workshop, I said, you know, what's going to be the role of AI? And immediately I got the one paper on the role of AI for cell differentiation. It's one of the hardest things for the scientists to do with stem cells and they're already on it with AI. And it's like, what a beautiful, you know, integration of technology. So uh, it's definitely on the program. So Adam asks a question. With so many extinctions and populations in decline, how would you prioritize which species you focus on? Yeah, well, so as an entrepreneur, I'm purely opportunistic. I look for passionate people. I look for science that's going to be really applicable, that can make a difference. Those are the biggest things that we look for. Um, 
at the end of the day, when we put all the different wild genomes proposals together, we try to look at, is there any synergy between teams that we could actually, you know, if somebody's working on one part of the coral challenge and another, could we put them together? Um, we look for things that are outliers. Um, the project One People, One Reef, and I have two people from One People, One Reef right here. <laughs> Nicole Crane and Giacomo, who told you about his genomic sequencing. Um, you know, we look for people that are really making a difference and that are bringing us sort of a broader view of this whole challenge of integrating technology. And I think Magul did such a nice job in that very short video uh, that he did from a very remote island uh, at, I think, some ungodly early hour to help me with my talk. Um, you know, Wayne, that whole challenge that they have between traditional knowledge and new innovative science and how do they understand more about what's going on with their, their fish their, that they depend on. Because, you know, typically environmentalists come in and they say, oh, you just need to create a marine protected area. You know, just wall it off. And you can't do that when people are living on it. But can you say, well, let's have science help us tell you how healthy that population is and at what density it needs to be. Or that coral reef, what challenge they're having with, with their livelihood. So I, I, I look for people who really are going to apply, apply it to make a difference. Makes sense. Um, you mentioned the, the, the folks at YAP who are doing this project, and I was really struck by their statement that we're trying to augment our traditional knowledge with science. And at my day job, I teach at Stanford, and we've, we've had at, uh, at the Rumsey Map Center at Stanford, traditional Marshallese navigators and canoe builders talking about their traditional knowledge, same sort of context. And as I was listening to that, I thought, well, you know, maybe we need some of the reverse. The, some what? Some of the reverse. Oh, yeah. Where uh, certain folks in the West would be more open-minded about augmenting their science with ethnographic wisdom. Mm -hmm. Have you seen instances of it flowing the other way? Are the sciences influenced by the cultures they interact with? Well, you know, I can't speak for Nicole, but I think that that project in particular is profound in that it truly is collaborative. They are really learning from each other. And, um, and I, I think, you know, that, that is really my goal, not on traditional knowledge, but <laughs> I got to say, conservationists are very traditional. I know you're using it in a different way, but it is an old school approach. This, you know, wall off and protect is one school of thought. And they are completely anti-intervention. I mean, there were people when the California condor was going to go extinct that said, let them die with dignity. Right. I mean, David Brower, this dearly loved person, said, let them die with dignity. They freaked out when they started um, using condor puppets to feed the condors. They said that would ruin condors yeah. forever, that they'd just become fast food condors. And there are now 350 condors flying in the wild. They started with 22 that they brought into captivity, 22. And, um, and now they're releasing them. And I forget the name of the tribe up in Northern California or Oregon uh, that is really going to be the, the next release site. And they just feel like, you know, part of their... Their history is now yeah, back. I, I believe that's the Yurok. It is the Yurok, yeah. And the Yurok, by the way, I, if for us uh, folks in California, the Yurok are doing some amazing things, um, not just with condors, but with uh, getting rid of dams. And it's it's really super vibrant that's culture. Great. I love hearing that. Um, but now, you know, the condor is an example of, you know, that John Muir, everything's hitched to everything else stuff. The problem with the condors is they come back that before Spanish contact, a big source of their food was whales washing up on beaches right. and elephant seals on beaches. Now, admittedly- You've got plenty of elephant seals. Yeah, and admittedly, the, uh, the, the shipping industry seems to be doing a good job at causing whales well, on beaches. I, but, I mean, do you take that into account as you decide, you prioritize which species to work with? Yeah, that, that goes back to a question that somebody else raised that I didn't 
fully answer when we say what kind of projects. I, I sort of talked about the people, but we do think about the species um, and whether or not they have an ecosystem that can actually support them. And I got to say the Joshua tree was one that I, I knew all the problems with, you know, what, what do you call them? Mo motorbikes and a lot of the challenges of tourism in that area. And I thought, oh, good luck, Joshua Tree. Um, but it was a compelling enough project and an important enough, an important enough for us to do. But um, yeah, we absolutely look at the right habitat. And we would not want to bring back, either from the brink of extinction or from extinction, the species that, that are not going to have a place on this planet. Because at the end of the day, it's not about showing off and doing a one-off. The black-footed ferret is not about Elizabeth Ann. That whole project is about restoration. And we're going to have many Elizabeth Anns if we're lucky. And we're in the process of um, cloning the other cell line, which is a male, which will be really incredible if we succeed. So I have two last questions. Yeah. So we'll start wrapping up here. And this one question, this is in part coming from Kevin. I wasn't going to no, okay, mention okay. it, but... Uh, so the question is, from uh, what was your first project at Revive and Restore, and what was the pace of introducing new projects to the ecosystems of ideas under which Kevin wrote? Ah, the mammoth. The mammoth, the elephant in the room. <laughs> so um, when Stuart and I started talking about de-extinction, the first person that we went to even before we use that term, was George Church um, at Harvard. And I'd already worked with George on uh, personalized medicine and uh, with the Human Genome Project and or his personal genome project. And George was really keen on the woolly mammoth. And we bought into it fully because we really believed that he and others wanted to bring the woolly mammoth back to help with ecological restoration. And I still believe that that is a possibility. We never liked, none of us liked the hype that it was gonna solve climate change because it was never gonna solve climate change. If it has a place in the environment, it could augment and complement all the other things we have to do to stop climate change. Um, but that project, which we worked on with George for um, close to seven years, I guess, total, uh, we funded a small amount of dollars into the, his lab and. We definitely had staff members putting time into that. Um, but at the end of the day, it's a very expensive project. And we got an opportunity um, to, we, there was a, a private investor who came in who said, you know, I could put this project on steroids. And I want to funnel that money straight through Harvard. And I want to buy the IP. And that company is called Colossal. And they took over the project, I guess, um, close to two years ago now. And, you know, I'm a little bit sad about it because I love being part of that project. And really, uh, you know, we continue to work with George Church and um, obviously in We Are As God, Stuart's film, you could see the passion and interest in working with Sergei Zimov uh, in Pleistocene Park. You know, they're amazing scientists doing really important work. But um, I don't mind, uh, you know, not having to answer about the ethics of, of bringing back a woolly mammoth. I got tired of that question. Yeah, well, you know, it's, 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 and I have one last question, but you know, it reminds me of the chicken egg argument that we now have established to the question of what comes first, the mammoth or the <laughs> mammoth meatball, that in oh, fact, someone just made a right. mammoth meatball. Me personally, having once helped excavate uh, pygmy mammoths uh, fossils out on the channel lines, I would love a pygmy mammoth, you know, it's sort of the size of a small, anyway. Okay, last question. Jennifer Tung, where are you? Where's Jennifer? Okay. In the dark. Okay. Or up there. Oh, good, right there. Okay. All right. Jennifer's question. How can I get involved with cell culture projects as a scientist with a lot of unconventional cell culture slash isolation experience, abalone, tuna, tuna salmon, etc. I don't know exactly how to answer that, but I'm Ryan at reviverestore.org. Good. And 
on that note, let's all give Ryan a hand. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Paul.